Welcome, uh, everybody. It is great to have you here for uh, for our panel. Let's get uh, our slideshow started. Uh, so this session is called Smuggling Academic Discourse into Pop Culture Reviews. Uh, my name is P.T. McNiff. I am uh, an associate professor of writing at the University of Southern California, and I am a co-host of the Long Take Review, which is the podcast that we'll be talking about today. Uh, and with me are uh, two of my three other co-hosts. Our third is on the way uh, and will be joining as soon as possible. Um, but Antonio, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Antonio Lofano. I'm a professor in the writing program at the University of Southern California. Uh, also one of the co-hosts, as, as PT mentioned, uh, and my, my third, my, the third co-host, Greg. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Cass. I am an associate professor of writing at LaSalle University, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm the director of the writing program there. But most importantly for today, I will share that I am also a co-host of the Long Take Review podcast, um, and we're really excited to be able to share a little bit of our journey with you all today. So our talk is called Smuggling Academic Discourse into Pop Culture Reviews, as PT said, and really that's the spirit of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm thinking pure Mary Poppins. Let's give them that spoonful of sugar and just a little bit of academic discourse medicine along the way. So we hope you're here to uh, join us in our smuggling activity. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you both. And I just wanted to give a, a brief overview. I will, I will let Jen uh, Subchakchai Banker introduce herself when she's able to join us um, because a big part of the story of this show is rooted around her. She's really our fearless leader. But uh, when she comes in, she can introduce herself and tell her story. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about the show. So our, our tagline is a podcast where four college professors talk film, providing insight, not assigning homework. So uh, our show started in March 2023. The sort of winding path to it existing is one of the things we'll be discussing. Uh, this week, two nights ago, we recorded our 85th episode. So we've been pretty consistent at uh, churning out content, which is a terrible phrase, a uh, way to say it. But uh, we have been we have been working on that. It's real. It's us and then also us on the slide. I didn't think about that when assembling the slides. Um, and so we have uh, currently over 450 subscribers across uh, across different platforms and over 70,000 streams, which is modest. It is not a, especially in the, the realm of film criticism, this is not a uh, runaway success story per se, but I'm pretty confident at least to say that if we had focused more on our academic interest and tried to do a podcast about that, we would have a much smaller audience than uh, starting from the perspective of let's talk about movies and then uh, and then tr trying to sneak in some of our academic stuff underneath that um, that banner. So uh, in terms of what the show is and how we set it up, what we offer to our audience, uh, it is uh, reviews of new releases are the vast majority of what we're doing. New releases of movies. Um, those have both non-spoiler and spoiler sections, uh, which allow us to, uh, you know, invite people in who maybe haven't seen the movie yet are interested in learning about it uh and then a clear warning sign with a little musical break to let them know when when we're going into giving away what happens in the movie usually jumping right to the end uh in order to emphasize the spoiler nature of it uh and the movies we discuss sort of can be divided into two uh, clear categories, potential award contenders, where we're looking ahead to sort of the Oscar race and uh, some of those prestige movies that come out. Uh, and then also popular franchise entries, because at heart, uh, we are we are nerds. Uh, I don't know if Antonio wants to be included in that. Uh, he frequently steps out for those episodes, but uh, he has his franchises. He has his nerds as well. Uh, and we we also do reactions to award season checkpoints. So when there are big nomination days or award ceremonies, uh, you know, precursors to the Oscars, the Golden Globes, the SAG Awards, the the um, BAFTA, the British Oscars, 
that exists. We'll we'll check in on those too. We have been including some more that are not about particular movies or events, but looking at earlier uh, Oscar history, uh, t taking a year and seeing what would we change about that. Doing uh, doing flashbacks about the, those those instances, and also uh, doing drafts of movies that we think are interesting, leaning into that some of that discourse of. Um, making everything in life fantasy sports, but like sort of one of our fantasy movie rosters we would want to have. Uh, and finally, we have our own award show called the the LTRs or the Letters, where we give out the uh, the awards for what we are uh, most we were most excited about. Not predicting the awards, but just trying to figure out what do we want to honor. Um, in addition uh, to that, we also smuggle in our academic background in these, uh, I don't want to say subtle because we do call it out, but in these are pretty consistent ways. We have a few sections during the course of every episode where we uh, we highlight our academic perspective. Uh, we have a section called the rhetorical situation where we make uh, <laughs> some explicit connections. Sorry, Antonio. Oh, sorry. Uh, I thought I thought I told you I was trying to to say something. Um, we have we make sort of a, a explicit academic connections, thinking about uh, we all teach rhetoric and composition uh, in addition to other academic pursuits. But what is uh, what is that scholarship? What what is our work in that realm say about the movie that we are discussing? We have uh, the recommendation algorithm, which helps us establish the audience of a film. Again, thinking about it from a rhetorical perspective of knowing. Uh, you know who who is this movie trying to reach, uh, and what you know, what should we expect about that audience? And also from the audience perspective, are you going to be interested in this? And then thesis, please, where we're hoping to find what the intent of a movie is, what is the argument that a uh, the movie is aiming to make. Uh, and then in addition to that, when we get to the spoiler section, we are frequently engaging in close reading and rhetorical analysis of of the film. Also, sometimes bringing in other uh, fields that we've looked in, cinema studies, obviously, but also legal studies and and sort of literature backgrounds to uh, to help with this. So uh, I do want to, this is sort of our, our plan for, uh, we're gonna open up the conversation. This has been a lot of talking by me, the last person who joined the roster of co-hosts. So uh, I'd like to open the door to uh, having uh, having the conversation um, to include Jen, who I know has uh, arrived. Uh, let me see if I can. There we go. Jen is here. She is. Uh, so Hello. Jen, if you, if you would like to introduce yourself, uh, and also we're at the point where um, we want to get almost behind the podcast, go predate that and say, how did the long take project as a whole begin because you're the you're the creator, you're the originator, you're the maker. What uh what what happened? How did this go? Hi everybody. So I'm I'm Jen Bankard, um, someone who doesn't understand how time zones work. Uh <laughs> obviously. Uh so apologies. Thanks, thanks everyone for waiting, waiting for me. Um the how this all got started, it was a very uh organic, almost you could say, uh stumbling process. Uh I think. If you wanted to go as far back as the Substack through which we host uh, the podcast, I also do written reviews on there. So that's kind of where it all started. Um, and and it was basically like my social media posts reviewing films I had seen got too long. And someone says, hey, instead of writing these like tomes on, on Facebook, why don't you start a website and then that sort of led the way to Antonio actually pitching an article that he wanted to do uh, with me. We were originally going to sort of have a uh, staged debate between the two of us about who was going to win the Oscars that year. And then I said, you know, if we're already recording our conversation through Zoom to transcribe it and then edit it, which uh, because Zoom is terrible at transcribing, sounds terrible. Uh, why don't we try to record this as a podcast? Uh, and and that's kind of how it got started. And the look on Antonio's face, pure terror, uh, <laughs> because he had never done a podcast. Uh, I had been a guest on other podcasts, but had never uh, hosted one myself. And so this was largely like a very experimental, like, let's just try it. And if we both hate it, We'll, we'll pretend it didn't happen. Um, and then we just kind of got rolling from there. We brought in Greg and PT. 
And I can't believe it's like, what, 85 episodes later? We're still going. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed it is. So, uh, yeah, a- Antonio, I guess, so both Greg and Jen, I don't want to speak, uh, get ahead of myself talking about Greg, but they had been on podcasts, co-hosted podcasts before, but you hadn't. Talk about w- what were your feelings about joining this and having your let's have a conversation that's in writing transform into the audio medium. Uh, you froze for a second for me, so I apologize, but um, but I think I understood the question. Um uh, so yeah, I I was such a fan of I'm like I've, I'm friends with Jen and and Jen and I always had lots of like um, wonderful discussions about like the Oscars and movies in particular. And I remember that um, part of what led to me pitching her was that I had like a, an Oscar um, prediction contest and then she won it. And I remember that. Um, that I took her out for lunch as like a as a congratulations on winning, but really I just want to talk to you about awards. And and I I made like um, a questionnaire for Jen about like the past Oscars. I, I eventually I gave it to, to like PT. You took it too eventually, right? About like well, who should have won the Oscars in this year and and all these other questions. And um, and we just had such a fun time talking about that. Um, I love reading stuff about like Oscar content and like predicting the Oscars, the who will win and who should win. And so I remember Jen and I often end up on the same shuttle um, uh, from the university to to the train station. And um, and I sort of like I was like, I'm going to pitch Jen. (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to make a suggestion. uh, that we can that we can write one of those articles that I love reading because like um, because I just love talking to her about it and I just wanted to to do it I thought it would be so much fun and so then yeah on the morning when she uh, when we were supposed to record I had I had my my stuff prepared for the day and then um, and then she texted to say like oh what if we switch to a podcast and uh, so she didn't actually see my face but I think that she could imagine my face based on the lukewarm reply <laughs> um, that she received, which was that like, I don't know what that, I don't know how to do that. And I'm a little afraid about doing that. But the other thing is, is like, well, but I trust Jen and I like Jen and I like uh, talking to Jen. And I like, I, I kind of hate the sound of my own voice and I don't really want to record it, but like, you know, let's just do it. Um, so, so, um, so anyway, so yeah, that's that was the first episode, which was an Oscar prediction episode um we only covered the sort the the sort of like uh, above the line categories so like the major categories um and yeah and it was a lot of fun but then you know then i i believe we, we I, i'm going to move to to jen and greg and, because the, the second episode was like moving to those below the line categories um i'm not i don't have a specialty in film i don't really understand like a lot of the, the, like those categories so i wouldn't have been able to add anything to that so um so why don't we take it away to the second episode of jen and greg uh i'll i'll take the opportunity to jump right in and so uh in the spirit of this panel and uh knowing that a lot of you uh here with us uh thank you for joining us a lot of you are either looking to create a podcast or you're you know looking to manage your workflow and and how uh you're producing your podcast um so i will say uh you know this then takes us back kind of towards the pandemic I had accidentally become a kind of expert podcast guest, which is really this accidental thing that happened to me when we're all stuck in our homes. And I was just very active on parts of of nerd Twitter, but particularly Star Wars. I I can tell my digital background keeps disappearing slightly and you see a a little Lego Star Wars robot appear. So so that (laughs) gives me away. Um, and uh, a few people who I had met through social media kind of asked me to come on their podcast and talk, and it snowballed very quickly. Um, and I had kind of managed my online identity as there was academic Greg, and I had certain accounts that only talked very important school stuff. And then I had uh, nerd Greg who would go participate on these podcasts and promote uh, those uh, shows and so on. And Jen offered me the inter- <laughs> the opportunity to, to finally become whole and to bring the two halves of myself uh, together. And, and I offered those comments because um, I think a lot of us experience that. Um, whatever your kind of personal professional boundaries are, 
I think we sometimes feel that necessity to keep those very separate. And, you know, if that's uh, the four of us are teachers, so sometimes it's like, well, I don't really want my students to see this side of me, or I don't want that to be the first side of me they see. Um, and one thing I've always uh, respected about Jen, not to compliment her, is that Jen is just Jen, and she uh, wants to be herself and kind of inspires me as an <laughs> academic to not try to hide part of myself or, or make that a secret. Um, and so I believe she gave me a call uh, because we were old grad school friends and because she knew I was somebody who watched every single film nominated for an Oscar each year. And so uh, if you need somebody to talk about those uh, very, very far below the line categories of documentary shorts and, you know, uh, best foreign language and, and so on, I think uh, she called me in. The other way to phrase that is Antonio took all the easy talk. Uh, kind of cleaned up with the rest of them. Um, but we had a really wonderful time. And, you know, if you are somebody in the audience thinking about how you're you're trying to find your way into these spaces, I would really, you know, say that the, the big democratizing factor of the podcast zone is it is just conversation. And I think, uh, among other things, if, if you're a professional who has to schmooze a lot at cocktail receptions and so on, you're used to that kind of filling the space. And um, there are, are very few expectations about it being a very formalized system or, or, or conversation. All the fans I talked to uh, from this show, and, and we do have a few, uh, I, I was gonna say rabid, but that seems cool, uh, impassioned fans of our show. What they really like about us is it feels like they have four buddies who live in their phone and they get to plug in and listen to us for, one, two, or maybe three hours a week uh, when we get going um, and just have that kind of informal chat. And so at its best, Jen has created that space where we can kind of just be ourselves and she has never asked too much of us. She'll, you know, she won't assign homework to the audience, but she assigns homework to us to just like, maybe like be 75% goofy, but bring that 25% of real scholarship uh, along with it. And uh, for the most part, I think we can deliver on that. Um, and and I, I'll, I'll have more thoughts to say about reception of that, um, because I, I think it is surprising how much people like that 25%. But um, really, I'll, I'll throw it over to PT, uh, the most uh, joyful amongst us, to pick up on that wonderful chat comment, um, and to say, <laughs> PT, how did you join the team? Uh, I basically, like, was bothering Jen for like a long time that like we should do a podcast because Jen was appearing on podcasts and I wanted to talk back when she was saying things when I'd listen to a podcast I wanted to be able to add in my thoughts uh, and so I was like oh this would be fun like we could do something around this and the like it was great to throw out there without knowing anything about how to do it or or really putting any effort into learning how to do that and so it was just kind of a like that's something that could go in the podcast that we would say when we were texting or if we got to talk in the hallway uh in at, around around work and then she would would was letting me know that there was uh these two episodes that were going to come out which were uh, Antonio talking about the awards everyone wants to talk about, Greg talking about the awards that only Greg can talk about because no one else watched all the documentary shorts. Uh, and then there were a bunch of the technical awards and she's like, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that. And I was like, I'll look that up. And so instead of looking up how to do a podcast, I looked up stuff about editing and costume design and all that. And so that way she could complete the trifecta of having all the categories covered. And then we kind of went from there of, well, why don't we respond once the awards come out? Let's try to get on together to talk about how it went versus our predictions. Uh, and then we began talking about new movies and went went from there. Uh, so I, I guess it, because I, I mentioned it, uh, it self-deprecatingly as not being good at knowing how to figure it out. Uh, Jen, what were the steps that you took? And maybe we have a lot of people here who seem to already have podcasts. Maybe they know this, but I think it's good for anyone who might watch this down the road. What were the steps that you took to actually get these conversations recorded? And you can begin with the uh, unintended recording of the first time with Antonio that was supposed to end up in a different mode. Yeah, so I'd say our first recording was through Zoom, and that's, you know, largely due to online teaching post-COVID, right? All of us use Zoom. And I was like, oh, yeah, we'll just do that. And I think our original plan was to record a transcription and then edit it. So it was like it kind of just naturally 
fell into into that platform but then and and to be clear i had zero knowledge of editing or audio recording or any of the sort of technical side of of the podcast um i i have a lot of friends who are podcasters kind of a network especially the star wars podcast that i had guested on as greg referred to like I sort of like hit them up to be like, well, what do you use? Like, what do you, and, and sort of like had to really learn on the fly, uh, like what that whole world was all about. And um, uh, basically like the first episode that we did on Zoom went so well that I was like, well, if we're going to do this for real, I want to do it right. And so then I sort of, sort of the started this research process about like, okay, how do I teach myself how to do all this? Um, and what we, we settled, what I, what I learned was there's, sort of infinite depth to how much work you can put into that side of things. Um, and so for me, it was really about um, not just trying to get my cat not to walk on my computer. Apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> but um, how to kind of balance the sort of time management. Like, I don't want to spend hours and hours doing this, but at the same time, I want it to be of a certain quality. Um, and then I kind of landed on, um, you know, trading, uh, a little bit of money for time because <laughs> that is a that is a delicate equation i think that all of us have to kind of negotiate uh when we're podcasting and so we now we use uh zencaster and basically what that does is uh create like records everybody's tracks locally and then mixes it for me and so you know and i still do a fair amount of editing after that um to kind of like uh, you know cut out tangents that don't really make sense for the listener or kind of you know that sort of or you know if if you know we have, we have we, someone tells a bad joke that we want to cut out um that's that's usually me uh who instantly regrets saying something and, and and uh so yeah so it's still it's still a lot of work on my end and but but you know i guess the inspirational part would be i knew absolutely nothing before starting this and now i feel pretty confident using audacity which is kind of like the main free editing software that you can use um uh i've upgraded my mic twice <laughs> um so it really was kind of this rabbit hole that i got kind of got sucked into um uh and 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 i don't know if you have to care about that stuff as much as i do um in order to have a successful podcast i think people's tolerance what i forget sometimes is people's tolerance for low quality audio is actually much higher than i assume um uh but yeah, I don't know if I got I got too far away from the actual question of PT, but no, I mean that that was that was the question uh, at, the, at the heart of it. But what was the what's the journey? And you know, I, I will say, uh, echoing what Greg was saying earlier about how you, know, you talk to people who listen to the show, which is sometimes people in at least for me, like in my life, who I know who are like, oh, you were on a you're on a podcast, I'll listen to that. And sometimes it's people who just you know comment or. Uh, uh, you, you, we don't know in real life, uh, but they do, they, they do, rec um, compliment the show on sort of how, how smooth it runs and how the, the editing, uh, that, that Jen does. And that is a lot of the work. So if we're talking about the, the labor, uh, behind the scenes labor of the show, Jen is doing 90, 95% of it. I, I would say, I don't know if she agrees with that, but, um, but it's, uh, it's a lot now that she just edited the, ep the episode we recorded the other day. She's like, no, I agree. 100%. That is that, that had two separate recordings. I had a stitch together. <laughs> I had to have intro and outro music every time there was a transition. So it makes sense to the viewer. Yeah. That one was like a high, much higher than average threshold of like, I need to know what I'm doing <laughs> part oh, of it. Um, but the, you know, to be honest, there's some days where if I know I have a lot of my you know my i have a lot of papers to grade my my actual you know job is is requiring me my kids are requiring me to take them back to activities like when my schedule is too heavy i know that there there is i can put less time into it it's like sort of like if you have the time to listen back to the whole episode and kind of clip things here and there and really mold it and shape it in the way that you would an essay um or an article that you're writing you know, you can do that, but at the same time, I, sometimes I just, you know, do the, listen to the beginning to line up the music or like, you know, and, and do the, there is a bare minimum that if I'm, if I'm pressed for time, I can do. So it's really interesting having to learn how not to give into my natural tendencies to be a perfectionist and be like, well, I got to listen to every minute and like, make sure it's all sounds good. And like, 
um, listen back to the flow of the conversation and make sure it makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, reining myself in so I don't spend hours and hours doing it, I think has been maybe the biggest challenge. I, I think like a lot of the people here who are uh, who are instructors who uh, teach students, guide students, uh, it's it's a it's a lesson in having to take your own lessons and having to sort of listen to yourself to be like, right, we would tell the students, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't get bogged down in trying to get every every single part of what you are working on correct. So. I think that makes sense. Uh, how uh, I'll throw this open to anybody. I don't want to have it keep uh, make Jen keep talking about things. But um, how would uh, how would we how would we say that the sort of workflow in terms of choosing our episodes and and topics? Uh, how would uh, how would we want to describe how we've evolved on that and how we sort of landed on figuring figuring this out? Well, Greg, actually, when we first started, had a really good piece of advice for me. I think it might have actually been, my memory's hazy, but it might have been the first time I was guesting on a podcast. And I said, well, what, do you, what kind of prep do you do? And you're like, just treat it like class, right? Do a rough sketch of notes and outlines, kind of have a general plan, but be 100% ready to sort of like improvise and go off off script if you need to. And like, you know, we've all had probably classes where that's happened, where we thought we were going to be doing one thing, and then the students kind of input tells you you need to go in another direction and podcasting I think is very similar uh, and so that was really good advice advice Greg that you had given me and so that's sort of what our process is generally like I try to make an outline of like general talking points you know we have the organization of the different segments that PT was mentioning earlier um, but you know if something comes up we just run with it you know what I mean like it's we're very willing to kind of let go of what we had planned Um yeah, I don't know what the experience like. What, what's that? What is that like for the rest of you? <laughs> right, I'm the one. I'm the one making the outline, but um, maybe it's totally different for all of you. I mean, I, I'm on the fewest episodes. I'm, I'm, I'm. I feel like I'm the most selective about like which ones I want to. <laughs> I want to join in on, but um, for me, it's often I'll see something like a movie that like no one else in my world wants to see. Like no, no, no one in my family wants to see. I'm often by myself watching it but I love it so much. And I just want to talk about it with like these, like with my three best like film friends. So I will just like, I'll, I'll send a text saying like, let's watch this. I want to do this. And let, and I'll push it until like all of the strangers, you know, a small film that not a lot of people um, saw becomes an episode and I can, and I can, you know, hear their wonderful thoughts about it. And I can appreciate these things, these movies that again, often I, I'd watch sort of alone. It's nice to have like this little community who's like willing to like see some 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 things like that. How about with for the rest of you? Um, I'll I'll jump in to say uh, I I completely agree with that advice to to keep it loose and and that is exactly how I do my lesson plans as an instructor. I have bullet points that I'm hoping to get through, and if I get through half of them, that's great. But if you know uh, we're speaking in a week where it was a good time to remember sometimes the students aren't ready for your bullet points and you have to spend the time with them talking about their world and making sure they're ready and just roll with what that class is and not feel rigidly tied to to what it was supposed to be um when it comes to uh topics you know it it is funny because i i, I hope you're you're getting the sense that we are very collaborative and we have fun we, we don't get into outward fights, but we do have to kind of all sacrifice. You know, um, I would say uh, it's become a running joke on the show that there were two films this past spring that I desperately wanted to do what Antonio just said to talk about. That it, and and we, we just couldn't fit them in. And, and I, I only hold the most minor resentment. But it, it comes down to, you know, we don't like to we like to keep up with what's coming out each week. And that usually defaults to whatever the biggest release is. Um, it's, you know, um, there was a good question in the chat, which we'll, we'll unpack a little bit more about the number of our listeners and some of our metrics. But we do hear from people who say, you know, I was planning to see this movie and you haven't reviewed it yet. It, is that a bad sign? Should I go back and skip that one? Should I, you know? And so uh, I think we've built slowly this um, this kind of uh, reputation for being ready with with the new releases and um, you know, uh, we're fortunate enough to be in media markets where we can often get that first weekend of some of those slower uh, being in there in L.A. And Boston's often in the second weekend, but I, I get to a surprising number of them um, before wide release. So just for example, uh, the, the, the tough to edit film uh, episode that was just mentioned was our review of Anora, which 
we got to as fast as possible because that is a front runner for best picture. And so we are hoping that when everybody, you know, goes to see that movie this weekend, they can have the pleasant surprise of their film buddies already ready uh, to, to talk about it. Um, and I think, you know, all four of us have a, a good skill at um, leaving our egos at the door and not being resentful when Antonio says, I'm not seeing Venom, or when PT says, animated, never heard of it. Uh, but we kind of trade off and on uh, throughout the year and, and uh, approach with good spirits. And, um, and then some of those special episodes that were just mentioned are our way to go back. And, you know, um, this when we get to our end of the year award show, I already have a list going of like, all right, you didn't let me talk about these when the, the they came out. So I'm gonna, you know, focus on those performances and help. Um, I I think it's it's a lot of fun, and you know, uh, if you don't take yourselves too seriously, the collaboration just kind of naturally flows. Great, uh, I, I appreciate how not resentful you are because you have once again brought up that we didn't talk about uh, Love Lies Bleeding or Civil War, a movie I will now never watch, uh, not because of you, <laughs> but because of the world. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, oh yeah, and and I think that in addition to what my my colleague said, you know, we have a uh, shared Google Doc calendar that's sort of like week to week, uh, you know, to get to the sort of I guess technical uh, elements of it. And I I've done it sometimes, like usually if it's late at night. Uh, I hope I hope these three never look at the time of the edit, so it'll be like one thirty in the morning, and I'm like, what are the movies coming out in the next six months? And I'm like adding it in to be like, this could be good, this could be good. Uh, and then because Jen again is is our is our main scheduler, fearless leader. Uh, someday there may be an episode that she's not on, uh, but uh, so far that has not happened. Uh, and so she sort of calls it down into like what she thinks might be interesting. I keep, I keep suggesting it. You're you're all the ones that are standing in our way. Like I've given you the password to our Zencaster account. Like you you can get in there. I I lost that. I lost that email. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So so I think you know we we have that. We sort of comment on the on the doc, and we have a long running uh, text thread to sort of get the schedule down and figure out what the, what the, what the plans are. Um, so uh, I guess the last thing I want to say before we, we start uh, answering the question that was already in the chat and open it up for more, uh, more questions uh, is I did want to get into the sort of the academic component. Cause I think it maybe was clear from our stories that we did not necessarily begin from like, Ooh, let's make sure we talk about these movies as rhetoric and composition faculty as professors, but it was just, we love to have these conversations. Can we just do that? And also, you know, cr create something that can be shared beyond just our fleeting uh, back and forth. Uh, but over time, I think we have made it more of a, of a planned integrated component to say, let's lean into this. We have this other part of us, as Greg was saying, we can make ourselves whole. Uh, so, I mean, Jen. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm always turning to you. But Jen, what, uh, like, how do how do you recall that evolving, and what what do you speak on that? I guess I I think so. So I think a good way to illustrate how this has changed over time is that our tagline when I we started uh, was the long take review, a film podcast with one eye on the Oscars race. Yeah, very uh, very pithy. Um, and. And now it is recently, we changed it like maybe like two or three weeks ago, uh, in part because we were doing the proposal for this panel. And then I was like, wait a minute, like, why are we, why are we not like advertising that we're professors? Like that should be an asset as opposed to something we downplay. Right. Um, and, and so now it is the long take review for where four college professors talk film. Uh, and you probably saw it on one of the slides, right? The, the, the cute um <laughs> reference to us assigning homework uh and and so part of it was uh the inspiration for the show once antonio sort of like gave me the window to try it out way back when uh was that i obsessively listened to all oscar pundit podcasts so it's just a regular and part of it's because i have a long commute to campus Part of it was the pandemic. It was just this confluence of like, I've always been interested in the Oscars and it kind of became my fantasy football where like, I'm just like, every time I have the opportunity, I'm driving somewhere, I put one of the shows on. And a lot of those shows are either by film critics 
uh, or entertainment journalists. So the people who are doing the interviews with all of the, the cast and crew of all these movies and they're kind of on the ground. They're like more they have more insider access um, to the awards race. And, you know, there's no way that we can keep up with those. Right. Because we have other jobs. <laughs> we're, we're we're teachers and scholars and uh, we're not we're not journalists. We're not going to these all these film festivals. We're not interviewing all these people. We're not seeing all these advanced screeners and stuff like that. And so it, it kind of it I realized through every episode that we did that we we naturally were talking about teaching and how it related oh like if I were talking to my students about how to edit something down I can definitely see that being a you know applying to this movie that we're talking about or you know hey let me dust dust off this like obscure uh, critical theory that I had to learn about in grad school and oh it actually connects really well with the themes of this movie so I noticed that we were doing that anyway every once in a while and so then I said you know what like from a marketing perspective you know our academic background and kind of that lens through which we watch these movies is kind of what differentiates us from everyone else who's doing a, a film or Oscar podcast. And so then we started kind of building in the um, the segments that kind of overtly referenced us as academics and kind of leaning more into it and, and kind of making it more part of our brand sort of, right? Um, the other thing too, to be, you know, full disclosure, you know, if we, if we do it this way where it's very academic forward, uh, you know, it's something we can put on our CV. It's something we can write about in our promotion letters, right? It's something that we can consider a part of our work as humanities scholars, right? And, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but like uh, with, with the, the listeners that we have right now, but um, I think just it, it wasn't, yeah, like PT said, it wasn't initially what we were going for. I think we were just thinking we'd do it for fun because we all are movie nerds. Uh, but then it, we kind of realized the potential that it could have if we leaned in. So would you say that we're not only smuggling academic discourse into pop culture reviews, but we're also smuggling pop culture reviews into our academic okay. dossiers? Yeah, 100%. And it's like, that's not that sketchy because I have found that by doing this podcast and writing my own pop culture reviews, like that directly influences my ability to connect with students about their process. Like I think, um, you know, having that that kind of constant weekly deadline of like, oh, we're gonna, I gotta, on top of all the other things I'm juggling, I have to get this content out, right? Um, that 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 made me realize, oh, the students with all the classes and extracurriculars and all those the jobs that they're applying for in med school and like all these things that they're doing, they face the same choices that we do for doing the show, and so that definitely has helped me become a better teacher. So I don't, yeah, I think the argument is very easily made about why it counts. <laughs> I will say that the portion of the audience that I hear from the most who are who like listen to the reviews and want to talk to me about them afterwards are current and former students of mine. And um, and what's what's wonderful is it's like it's often difficult, I think, after you're out of the context of a classroom to sort of sustain a conversation with the professor. Um, because once once I'm no longer your instructor and we're going and we have like, you know, a very established sort of relationship and like what I'm what I'm supposed to teach you in that given semester, you know, like occasionally you'll get like, oh, look at this. It wasn't this interesting case. And they'll send me like an article about it. But that's, you know, that's fine. But like because film is such an accessible medium and people feel comfortable talking about them regardless of what their expertise is or the, the level of understanding of the film, um, they'll often like want to continue the conversation in this way. It's an easy way for them to, um, to, to, uh, to, again, continue that conversation, continue that relationship, um, and to just like hear our thoughts on like subjects that, that go beyond what we taught them in the classroom. And I really like that point, Antonio. So in my teaching load, I'm only in first year writing and I get the question all the time, like, uh, can I take another class with you? And I am like, not unless you wanna take first year writing again. Um, and, uh, you know, you do look for those paths that you can show that you're a full human and that you have other interests than just what their homework was or, or where they put their commas or what have you. Um, I just also want to acknowledge from the other side, um, you know, uh, as we think about the humanities, uh, an area I deeply, deeply love, but have had limited opportunities in because of the the moment and the crisis, uh, quote unquote, that that the discipline faces. I think it's more important that uh, than ever that we move into other spaces because what we do in the humanities 
matters. It's really important. And it's also really desirable. And so um, I think, again, to, to rewind the clock to when Jen and I accidentally became uh, frequent podcast guests, what we brought was kind of the basics of our discipline, right? For me, initially, it was a lot of like, yeah, I had to read Joseph Campbell. And I know a lot about Joseph Campbell. If you want to talk how that applies to whatever you want to discuss, I'll come on and, and I'll do that. And I think um, inside the humanities, we have lost sight of how valuable that kind of basic analysis is to these fandom communities. And um, our, our expertise on the chat is, is primarily Star Wars and Marvel, but it's incredible how a little bit of that kind of academic rigorous analysis brought to those properties and those fandoms. It's like catnip, right? Sorry, I, I'm taking my cue from Jen's uh, window. It's like catnip where we uh, we get to bring these uh, fans who are looking for a way not just to say, I love this thing, but let me convince you it's really smart and and how it's become more meaningful to me. And I, I think we have brought an articulation of that that they can then use. And so when Jen, you know, brings up Derrida and then I hear on some other fandom uh, podcast, three steps removed from us, somebody else is mentioning Derrida. I'm like, I, I know where you got that. Like, I, I got there. I, I like, I can see that. And, um, you know, how to pick up on Jen's point as well, having just written a, uh, a, a promotion letter for somebody on the Zoom call, I will say that to me is really powerful. And I made this the case very plainly that this is important work and it's going to be more important in the years to come as we want to continue to show the the importance of our humanities work and why that kind of class, classic liberal arts training has some really important lessons to, to show us all. Well, on, on that note, I wanted to move us into the Q&A part. We already had a couple of cues that we should probably A. Uh, and so uh, Carolyn had first asked a little while ago, but how do we know about listeners and sort of how do we track, how do we track that? Uh, I, and I have, the, there's some components that I control, but the main ones are, are in Jen's capable hands. So Jen, uh, how how do we do that? So I mean, do we do that? Is kind of more the question. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't put a lot of time in that. I probably, if we were doing this full time, I definitely would because I think that is it is those kind of like analytics are are important to like how you kind of get the show out there and circulate and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I don't have time for that. Uh, but basically, any kind of platform that we are uploading to, um, and you know, the way that I did that was. If you have a podcast, you have to have a place to house it, right? So for us, that's Substack. So every time I I write, I create a new post, upload the audio file that we've recorded, write a little you know note, and then basically that creates an RSS feed that I can then put onto Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And the thing I got told, I don't remember if it was from Greg or 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 Greg's. Um, the other Greg who's who's on the Rebel Base Card podcast that we Greg and I are both uh, uh guests on sometimes. Uh Greg is the co-host. Um but uh somebody told me if you just get on Apple and Spotify, all the other more uh less less popular platforms sort of scrub um episodes from from those two. And so that's all I had to do. I just kind of like made a Spotify account, made an Apple podcast account, put our RSS link in there, and then it kind of every week automatically pops up on those platforms and then gets trickled down to all the other ones. Um, each one of those has, you can kind of go into your account and go into the settings and and see how many people have downloaded every episode, how many people have listened. Each one has a different threshold for like, it only counts if it's over 30 seconds or it only counts if it's over two minutes, right? Like, uh, so I think I, I haven't dug deep into like interpreting that data properly. Um, I'm not a like a, a data scientist by, just, by, by trade. By... Um, but uh, but yeah, and so our and our our Substack uh, account has like how many subscribers we have there, um, and for each episode, how many people downloaded and how many people viewed the post too, um, which often is way higher than people who have have actually downloaded the whole episode um, <laughs> so I don't know what that means um, but yeah so there are numbers out there that we can use to figure out how many people are listening PT is in charge of our YouTube channel um, that gets like thousands of views 
We've debated whether or not that's people trying to pirate the movies that we're reviewing, and then they accidentally find us. Um, <laughs> there were a couple any, of any clicks count. Any clicks? Count. Yeah. <laughs> In the promotion documents, yes. Any any clicks? <laughs> and on, on the first slide of this presentation. There, it all goes in there. But yes, there was uh, there were a few uh, of our reviews that got into some algorithm somewhere and they got like over 20,000 views. Uh, those views were like that you can look at the like how long people were there. Most people were only there for 30 or 40 seconds because I think they wanted to see John Wick chapter four, not hear us talk about John Wick chapter four and thought like, oh, this is I, I found an illegal uh, stream of it. So, uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm in that, uh, over in that zone where I can see that we usually get like 80 to a hundred views. Uh, and that seems to be divided between people who listen to most or all of it. And just looking at the, at the, the they have the average view time. Um, and that average seems to say there's some people who click on it, listen for a minute or two and are like, okay, I get it. Uh, whatever dumb bit we're doing in the beginning turns them off and they go away. Uh, and then there's people who listen to most of it or, you know, seem, seem to stay around for the whole time. So, uh, yeah, there are, there are metrics that are out there that you can, you can track. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, again, if, if we were aiming to be more professional with it, if it was aiming to be more of our primary, uh, endeavor, we would be, uh, doing a better job. And I'm talking about myself who I also run the, to the degree there's social media accounts, which is like le the letterboxed account, uh, Instagram and, uh, and then the Instagram spinoff threads. Uh, that's mostly like, I, I treat that mostly as just like a catalog of like, Oh, we did a new episode. Here's the description. That's just an edited version of what Jen already wrote for her sub -sec, describing it. And if people want to go back as, uh, I believe it was Rebecca mentioned the sort of idea of, oh, I, you know, someone who is interested maybe doesn't see a movie for a while uh, or isn't ready to, to, doesn't have the time to think about it. That if they find our show and then want to go back and see what else have you done, you can flip through the letterbox page and find it. Uh, but that's not really reaching out or like trying to like hustle to get new listeners per se. So I think that we're, we're pretty, uh, balance. I want balance sounds like it's necessarily a positive, but I think we're, we're, um, laid back in terms of trying to expand our, our audience and let, let folks come to us and see, see if they like it. Um, and, uh, wow. the other question, wow. oh, sorry. Okay. Greg, I was going to just say, and also, uh, we are, I think our next step is to explore a little more of that. Jen has recently made it, um, Substack as a platform lets you, uh, offer subscriptions and, we are exploring what those tiers might look like for us, both balancing what we can commit to. But um, it was actually our fans who kind of pushed Jen and said, I really like your content. I would give you money for this content, even though you're giving it for free. And so we've started to explore subscriptions. And then, you know, I think as is probably familiar to most people on this, how that can work with extra episodes for subscribers and extra activities or access to us. I don't I don't think we we have the influencer status where they're desperate to get on a discord server and and hear our our chats at any time but um I think you know we are trying to remain modest we're not ever trying to to really make this our living or become influencers we just want to contribute to the world in this if this way but um you know it's it's been a great opportunity to consider those because of our fans and if people are trying to decide what platform um, Substack has been very successful for us at at trying to to gather people and get our attention. And my notifications on that app every few days are somebody following us on that and then recommending my personal blog because they see my name on Long Take, and that's really interesting. Yeah, Jen, are we are we uh, revenue neutral at this point? Uh, yeah, I or... mean, so currently we have an optional paid subscription so the idea is like you can get all of our episodes for free um but it's sort of like if you want to chip in um you can subscribe through Substack uh for you know it's it's like maybe five to eight dollars a month or something like that right uh so not nothing too crazy and um you know that we don't have many uh, because it's optional. There, there's there isn't really like Greg was saying. We haven't yet created like a content incentive um, to get people to subscribe. It's more of like, hey, if you appreciate what we're doing and you want to kind of help us chip in. So right now it's basically covering our operating costs in terms of like it's enough to pay for the Zencaster account that we have to that helps us record. Um, 
and like equipment and like you know what i mean like it's like so it helps for sure um but we're not you know we're not like making bank on anything <laughs> for sure um uh i think our was our next question uh also from carolyn about the pca aca we have not attended that uh but we have been to the southwest um popular and american culture association in albuquerque which is a great uh really really fun uh conference if you haven't been um it's it's made for academics who are nerds uh of all flavors <laughs> <laughs> some might argue academics are always nerds uh but the, but particularly our kind of nerds yeah the like well, pop culture nerds yeah the, the the pop culture component of it yes um okay uh yeah so uh as as our host i i jumped the gun in the chat and said people can add questions in the chat but our our, our zoom host has noted you can also unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question like class i gotta wait <laughs> we can wait to see if anyone has like i i, I have a question that was I had in my back pocket for it um, because we're we're uh, here on the panel talking about uh, academic, uh, our, you're smuggling our academic interest into it. Does anyone have a memory of of us on the show of like a time when it was like, oh, this worked really well? Like I I had this you know uh, the, this theory that I studied in uh, you know in undergrad or in grad school. I had this um, uh, uh, you know knowledge. I, I have some thoughts for each of you about times when it happened, but I'll, I'll put it out there to see other times that you remember. I'll, I'll start. So, um, I'm, I'm a lawyer. So I, in an early, I'm a lawyer. And so, uh, in an early episode, I called myself the star Jones of the panel. <laughs> so whenever there's a movie that deals with like legal issues, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I will sometimes chime in on like my thoughts on that. So the movie that I, I really loved unpacking with these three was Anatomy of a Fall, um, where you had a trial system um, that is very unfamiliar. Like we have, we know American, what the American trial system looks like mostly through um, like, you know, movies and television shows that that cover that. So, so the French system, which was not familiar to me and how that operates um, and what the, what the implications of that would be both from like a logistical perspective, but also from like a narrative perspective. And once that sort of opens up, um, that, that, you know, provided me an opportunity to do like research um, on this legal system that I typically wouldn't do, but, but did in the service of like, you know, facilitating this conversation and talking about how those differences, those, those structural differences in the systems made for a really like interesting opportunity for drama in a, in a way that was like a, a genre that is very familiar, I think to most Americans became novel because of those structural differences. Um, so yeah, I, I loved doing that. I also play a lot of tennis. <laughs> so there was a challengers episode where I got to talk about like the logistics of tennis and that was, that was fun. Uh, how about the rest of you? Um, I remember, and I think this was on one of our slides, although I don't know if we actually played the audio clip because I, again, apologies for being late. Um, but our Barbenheimer episode, I think was very good because oh, yeah. we pulled in a lot of stuff that we know from rhetoric and composition into, uh, sort of unpacking that as a cultural phenomenon. And so like, we did a really nice, I think, cultural studies take on that, that I, that I don't think other film podcasts, at least that were talking about Barbenheimer did. So that's, that's the one that sticks out in my mind. Cause I think I got a lot of positive feedback about that where they're like, Oh, you really changed the way that I was thinking about this. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, I have memories of times I've tried to bring in a theory and I'm just like, I don't really know what to do with this. <laughs> like, I see this connection. Like, I think when we were talking about, we live in time. I had looked up, uh, Henri Bergson's, uh, lived time, uh, and concept of duration. And I knew that there was a way to apply it, but I kind of lost steam during the episode and was like, please help me. Um, and then I think we just moved on. So <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't always pan out, but it's always interesting, I think, to try to make those connections. 
I, it's so hard, uh, 85 in to, to pick some favorites. Um, but it, it is often funny um, because Jen and I uh, were in the same graduate program. We read a lot of the same stuff. And so when I hear her suddenly bring up a theory, I'm like, oh, I should have thought of that because I also took that required class. But um, I think it was actually also Anatomy of a Fall. And, and it's come up a few times where we talk about um, kind of indeterminacy. And that's something I really love talking about is when a film does not give you easy answers, even in terms of what happened. And I find that I get to exercise a lot of demons because whenever I teach a text in class, students reject it. They say like, no, I don't know what happened here. I reject it. It's, it's, it's useless. But um, I think uh, that helps people to, to or it helps me to kind of uh, get to grapple with those feelings I had teaching where I had to be more receptive. And here I have my own space to kind of be like, no, no, it's beautiful that you don't know the answer. And it's beautiful that, that we're not sure what the next day is for those characters. Um, and that works really well for me. Uh, and, and is also just some good old fashioned therapy. Uh, PT, what was on your list? I'm curious. Um, I, I had Barbenheimer, uh, basically the answer people had, I had Barbara, so Greg, you had some great, uh, insights, uh, on that one. I, I recall. And, uh, and Jen, you know, I think you had sort of in the, in the actual like Oppenheimer discussion, you had some, some good, uh, pulls and, and then Jen had the overarching thing. I, I was trying to prod Antonio to talk about anatomy of a fall. Um, that was my main one. So and it for works. me, I, it did. I, and mine was, remember, I remember doing a very, uh, going off the rails, like again, in just for myself, uh, and doing a deep Brechtian dive to talk about poor things and yeah. thinking about like the the path from Brecht to Fastbinder to uh, Lanthimos, and uh, I, there was it was one of the times when I started talking and I had like a whole thing written up and uh, Jen was very receptive, but also looking at the side of the screen to like look at the clock to be like, okay, like this is this has gone on so. Um, so yeah, great. Uh, we, we have some questions. Uh, Mary Ellen asked, and I think this is a, a big one here, is how receptive have, uh, have our programs been in accepting this work as part of our scholarship? Now, uh, we have one person here who's currently going up for promotion. We have another person who got promoted in the last year, year and a half, uh, and uh, another person who's going up for promotion next year, and that's me. So I want to know the answer to this even more than anyone. So uh, Greg and Jen, what do you want to say? about this from your experience. I, I, I mean, start, oops, yeah, go, ahead, go for it. No, I, I'm go the for one it, who got through it. So I'll, I'll start and then Jen is going uh, into it now uh, just to, to show all our cards. So um, I will say my, uh, so I, I'm not on a formal tenure track school. Uh, we do have uh, promotion tracks and um, long-term contracts, but it's, it's not a research uh, school. But I will say um, I receive very positive feedback. Uh, we, as as uh, you know, um, scholarship is defined in my uh, university. It's supposed to be uh, to uh, you know scholarship to the discipline. So I did you know my kind of due diligence of um, talking through all the conferences I went to and all the papers I presented and all the articles I submitted and maybe got uh, some interest in, but not always. But then I made it a strong point to, to kind of lay out the argument and to say that this is, to me, the democratization of our discipline. And if I'm being asked to contribute to the community as a part of scholarship, then this this is as a part of this. And um, I, I, I was successful. Uh, and uh, within the notes I received back from the committee, they they kind of pushed back a little. And, and you know, they said, well, you are the writing professor. You should be doing more with writing. But they recognize that that is meaningful scholarship and that it's outreach and and valued. Um, so I think I have a little advantage uh, compared to Jen uh, based on our institutions, but I found them very receptive. And, and I will allude again to the letter I wrote for Jen that has not been seen by Jen, which is, uh, you know, I really laid out the case that this is about, um, you know, uh, getting out of the white tower of academia and really finding people where they are and making this valuable. And I, I think it models what we ask our students to do, um, which is, you know, take these skills and translate it to different audiences in kind of the classic rhetorical sense. And so I think we're we're practicing what we pe preach. And that's what I uh, I wrote in Jen's letter, uh, which will be very successful, uh, I'm sure. But Jen, how do you <laughs> feel about it? 
Well, so I'd say that our program is pretty rece receptive and accepting of it as well. And that, but that's by virtue of the type of program we are largely, I would say, because we are, you know, Antonio, PT, and I teach in the writing program at USC, which I'm sure someone said at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, we are a teaching track faculty and we are not uh, administered by an English department, right? So we are our own, own autonomous program. And because of those two things, uh, we have kind of a pretty diverse faculty. Like a lot of us are English PhDs. Um, uh, a, a lot of people are MFAs. Like it, actually, yeah, we could just use ourselves as an example. So I, I ha I'm an English PhD. Antonio has a creative writing MFA. PT has a master's in professional writing and screenwriting, right? Like, so, so, you know, and that's just kind of like a, a tip of the iceberg in terms of like how many different types of faculty members we have in our program. Um, and I think a lot of it, it of the the work of of writing like a promotion cover letter is kind of making the connection between our pedagogy and kind of our professional practice. And so, um, you know, whether that's you're you're a published novelist or if you are writing um, articles that you self publish or you're writing academic journal articles, right? Like regardless of the things you're doing outside of the classroom, you know, you're always anyway going to have to make the case for why that is helping with your your primary job of teaching right and that, again this is, it would be very different if we were like research faculty or 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 a tenure track uh, program um and so i think i was already kind of accustomed to doing that to be like well my interest in x actually helps me become a better teacher because of y um and so this i think the work that we do on the podcast really fits naturally into that framework um and and hasn't really been hard. No one's questioned me on it. Like I in my promotion cover letter for this year, I had a whole section about the Substack and the podcast and how like uh, you know it it is a kind of a public humanities, a public intellectual project. Um, and I was like, when I was writing it, I was like, this is even a stretch for like what we used to do. You know, what I mean, I, I felt like I was really pushing the envelope in terms of trying to classify what we're doing as like. I think it was under the grants and funds <laughs> funding section. <laughs> um, and but then, my, you know, the the people who are on my uh, evaluation committee and like no one has protested. You know, what I mean, like I, I you know, when I had to cut the whole thing down, they were like, well, like out of everything you're listing on here, like the sub could probably get like, you know, one paragraph less or something like that. Right. But but no one no one challenged me on why that was even being mentioned in there. So. I, I do think at least within our institution, I, I can't speak for Greg's or anyone else's here, the, the idea of putting yourself out there in a way that is a, a credibility boost for the the university, for your department, uh, that, you know, not that like, oh, like where, where's the tipping point of like, well, I guess, I guess USC is okay because of this podcast, but that like any, anything that adds to the value of uh, of the the brand, as it were, is is a positive, and I think that's uh, something that can be framed when whenever discussing something public facing, such as uh, recording a podcast. Greg, uh, I was just going to add um, that was maybe my one hesitation, just to keep it one hundred with our our crowd here. Is like, oh, I am putting down that they should go find me on this podcast, and well, because they're all West Coast, we record sometimes very late at night uh, where I am. <laughs> And I'm, I I had a moment where I, you know, told my promotion committee, please seek out this podcast, listen to it. It's great. And then I was like, oh, I hope they don't find that one. Or I hope they, you know, um, so it is something to be mindful of that. Um, I think if you want to kind of do that, to have this uh, as a part of your, your record as a scholar, then you have to remember it is a public medium. And you know, nothing on the internet is secret. I'm uh, sure a lot of my students have found the podcast. I've heard from a very small percentage who have without my recommendation. And, you know, usually it's students who like me, but, you know, it, it could be the students who don't like me and, and I'd want to be cautious. And, you know, when Jen says she edits out some some jokes, that's probably uh, saving my career at times. I'm doing so that I, for you. I do appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> the, the audience should, should know that there is like a hair meter. That's how... How close Greg's hair gets to Rick Moranis <laughs> possessed in Ghostbusters is how close he is to just falling asleep yes. while we are recording post midnight East Coast time. Uh, the uh, the next question that we had in the chat uh, also for Mary Ellen, much more you know sort of technical basis. 
what kind of microphones do we use? Uh, I will say I have a, a Blue Yeti microphone, um, which I will I will show. I don't know if that helps. Um, but uh, but that's that was uh, that came per recommendation of I think both both Jen and Greg. Um, that was that, that came from from you all. Yeah, I had a Yeti until uh, my husband wanted to get me a really nice Christmas gift and upgraded my gear. So uh, right now I have a Scarlet. Um, but I, I would say that if you are, you know, just starting out and a, and want to do this as like a reasonable human being, a Yeti will be more than enough. Uh, I would, I would, yeah, I would say that because that one is like the sweet spot of like, it's not too expensive, but it will get you the quality that you need. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing too is like, it sometimes it takes us a little while to to figure out the like you got to make sure your ear if you're using earbuds that the my, the out, output of your sound is not coming from the earbuds it's coming from your microphone there's a lot of settings you always have to i obsessively check the settings in Zencaster or Zoom or whatever you know whatever you're using um and on my on my computer just to make sure everything is correct <laughs> i'm always paranoid that i'm going to do that wrong um so yeah I believe we learned recently during our episode on the movie Saturday night that if Jen takes her earbuds out and puts them down, that disconnects it just from stops Zencaster everything. and Zencaster stops recording. And so that was probably the worst edit you ever had to do because we had like five mini sessions because you had things coming up uh, that led to you taking your earbuds out and we didn't realize that. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I also, I plug in these like cans directly into it, which I think makes me look very goofy um but uh but that's okay um what my my attempts to use my airpods has always led to something being misdirected either the 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 audio or audio in or audio out so uh i just stick with this with the with with the yeti and i think that's that served us reasonably reasonably well um i will i will say i i posted in the uh in the in the chat um, links to episodes that we had we had discussed um, here. I'm going to also share our our final page here. Um, okay, there we go um, for for our contacts. Uh, I, I will also note that there was uh, we did have a, uh, a, a one of our participants, I believe Carolyn, uh, who said that uh, she wanted to Google our for our episodes on Anatomy of a Fall and Saltburn. Uh, Greg, do you do you recall if we did an episode? <laughs> On Saltburn? I fought so hard, Carolyn. I, I don't know why my taste is the ignored taste, but I I fought so hard uh, for yeah. that one. Uh, Jen has essentially told me that I'm welcome at any time to record solo pods. And I, I was close this week. I almost did it on a couple other films I got to see before everybody else. So um, I will take this panel as a shot in the arm to to commit to my taste uh, and, and actually do that. Um, uh, yes. Sorry, PG. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I will. I will. I, I will note that I think it isn't that it's your taste that gets uh, ignored. I believe that it is. Oh, I'm, I apologize, Antonio. Oh, it's I, okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I, I I typed it from from memory, and my memory was was wrong. Um, so uh, I'll I will change that and and update it when it goes gets distributed with the with the slides. Um, but yeah, Greg, I would say it's just that you see more movies, you see more new movies yeah. than us, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, uh, Jen and Antonio lead uh, better balanced lives than we do, and you go and see new movies, and I watch thirty two Universal horror movies uh, over the course of a month. <laughs> So that's the difference. And then, you know, no one's looking for the uh, Invisible Man Returns episode uh, necessarily. But uh, but yeah, so. Um, hey, the Invisible Man was in my dissertation. I'm up for, for talking about that. I don't know. We should have we should have done that. Uh, we should have done that for Halloween. We should have done like a classic universal. I'm already I'm already movie. ready for uh, next year. I have right. my ranking. But I, I would say that for Saltburn in particular, we really I think we got into a May, December versus Saltburn war. And Greg was just on it by himself. On yeah. Well, and it, it was also Sometimes that when you're right, it's awfully lonely to, to <laughs> have the better opinion. But, you know, I'll, I'll <laughs> sink on that ship alone in my principles. I'm happy to do so. Uh, Carrie Mulligan's incredible performance and I will. Or no, and Rosamund Pike was actually stronger in that movie. Uh, I'll, I'll go down. 
<laughs> and I think the other thing too was by the time that we would have recorded about a separate review for Saltburn, it had fallen out of the Oscar race. So this is largely my fault as well as because I'm often being like, we have to keep up with the monoculture. We have to keep up with the discourse. Like we have to be doing movies that are at the forefront of the Oscars race and that film critics really care about and that are either new releases or awards contenders. And PT, everyone else basically is often reminding me that, that, we don't have to care about that. And the PT in particular is always like, well, but why don't we go back in time and talk about old Oscar years and old movies? And I'm always the one who's like, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> well, I I, and then, I think it is interesting to note sort of our, each of us has a, a different reason to want to go and talk about the Oscars. Um, like Greg sees everything or sees as many things as he possibly can uh, in during the course of the year. And then we'll fill in any blanks once the nominations come out including the obscure animated movie that actually isn't coming out for another six months. He'll find the screening to go and, and see it. Uh, and, and Antonio is very much about like the righteous, like who should win, like who should have, who should be the person who's rewarded. I like the sort of the, the historical narrative that gets built about like the, the, the shifts and, and the perspectives and how it reflects what we're thinking about it. And Jen wants to win. Jen is interested <laughs> in, she wants the best Oscar pool ballot uh, every single year. And all of this is just to like bank up points to like figure out the best. It's all just watching tape. She's just like wearing her hoodie and just re re uh, reviewing the, the footage to get ready to play the game on Oscar night and win the pool. I'm Natasha Leone and his three daughters just with the Oscars instead of sports. <laughs> yeah. She's doing like a, a ten a ten team parlay. Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, for for coming. We have uh, you know to, here in the in the closing minute. Uh, just you just want to in encourage people to uh, follow follow a path that that speaks to you. Sometimes it, it happens in a in a, the uh, the randomness of life. Of we sort of fell into uh, first of all you know knowing each other and and being being in proximity of each other, but also having. Uh, having this opportunity to to talk about something we're passionate about, talk about something that we care about in our in our personal lives, but be able to marry it, marry it into our academic pursuits. And as, as Greg astutely said earlier, to help make us whole as uh, as complete people that we can present out into the world. So please feel free to contact us if you have uh, any further questions. We'd love for you to listen to the show, of course. Uh, and again, thank you for attending. Enjoy the rest of the symposium.